the romance of the rose a new translation by francis horgan oxford world's classics chapter seven the advice of the old woman and now courtesy and largest went briskly through the gate so that all four were together there protively and in secret all four saw the old woman she had been guarding fair welcome for a long time and was not paying attention she had come down from the tower and was taking her ease in the enclosure above her wimple. Her head was covered with a cap instead of a veil. All four of them ran up quickly and attacked her. She had no wish to be beaten, and said, when she saw all the four of them gathered together, By my faith, you seem to be very worthy, valiant, and courteous people. Now tell me without too much noise what you are seeking in this enclosure. For I do not suppose you have captured me. Capture you, sweet gentle mother. We have not come to capture you, merely to see you, and if it pleases you and suits you, to make you an unconditional offering of ourselves and whatever we have of value to do your gentle bearing capture you sweet gentle mother we have not come to capture you merely to see you and if it pleases and sates you to make you an unconditional offering of ourselves and whatever we have of value to do your gentle biding without ever failing you also sweet mother who have never been bitter we have come without any evil intent to ask you if you would please hello fair welcome to seeds his languishing in there and come out and play with us for a while he will scarcely soil his shoes or at least allow him to say one word to this young man so that they may comfort one another. This will be a great consolation to them and will be quite easy for you. Then this young man will be your liege man, even your servant, and you will be able to do whatever you like with him. Sell him, hang him, or maim him. It is good to win a friend, and here are some of his jewels. He gives you these clasp and these buttons, and indeed, he will soon give you a fine ornament. He has a most noble, courteous, and generous heart. 
and so he will not be a burden to you. He loves you very much and you will never be reproached, for he is very wise and discreet. We beg you to hide him or to allow him to go there without any suspicion. of misconduct. We beg you to hide him or to allow him to go there without any suspicion of misconduct. In this way you will restore him to life. And now if you please take this chapel of fresh flowers from him to farewell come. Comfort fair welcome on his behalf and greet him fairly. This will be worth a hundred marks to him. So help me God, said the old woman. Were it not that jealousy would know of it and I would hear myself blamed. I would gladly do it. But evil tongue is such a gossiping scandal monger. Jealousy has made him her sentinel and he spies on all of us, shouting and yelling without restraint, whatever he knows, and indeed whatever he thinks. He even invents things when he has no gossip to spread. He could not be prevented from doing it were he to be hanged for it. If that if were to tell jealousy about it, if that if were to tell, if that if were to tell jealousy about it, I would be brought to shame. You need you need have no fear of that, they said. There is no way in which he will be able to hear or see anything about it. He is lying dead outside, with his mouth wide open, and that ditch serves him for a beer. You may be sure that he will never, unless by magic means, gossip about those two, for he will never come to life, never, unless devils work miracles with poisons and antidotes, will he be able to accuse them. Then, I will not refuse your request, said the old woman, but tell him to hurry. I shall find a way in for him, but he must not say anything shocking or delay too long, and he must come very discreetly when I tell him. He must take care on pain of losing his life and his possessions, that no one sees him, and he must do nothing he ought not to do, although he may say whatever he likes. Lady, they said, it will certainly be so, and they both thanked her Thus they carried out their task. Oh. 
fall swimming. Whole thoughts were running along different lines. Said softly to himself, "If I am on on behalf, we undertook this task. Will trust me at all, and provided he did not." Renounce his love. I do not think that he would be in your interest in the long run to deny his request. I do not think that he would be. Your interest in the long run to deny his request, for he would enter secretly, given the time and the opportunity. We do not always see the wolf who takes the lambs from the stable. When they have been well guarded in the fields, you might go to church one day. You stay there for a long time. Yesterday, or perhaps jealousy. Who plays? Such tricks on the wolf might have to leave town to somewhere or other. Then he would come in secret or by night from the garden. Alone, without candle or torch, unless perhaps friend had been warned of it and was there to watch for him. In that case, he would be encouraged to lead quickly to the place. Unless the moon was shining, for the moon bright rays, for the moon's bright rays often harm lovers, or else he might come in through the windows, for he is familiar. With every corner of the house, and let himself down on a rope. In this way, he come and go. Farewell, come. Might perhaps come down to the garden where the young man was waiting. Or he might flee outside the enclosure, where you have held him prisoner for many days, and come and talk to the young man, if the young man could not go to him. Or when he knew you was asleep. If he could find the time and the opportunity, he might have the doors slightly open. In this way, the true lover might approach the rosebud, which so 
occupies his thoughts and pluck it without hindrance. If there were any way in which he could overcome the other gatekeepers, And I, who was not far off, though to yourself that I would do just as he said. If the old woman was willing to conduct me, that would do me no harm at all. If she was not willing, I would enter where I saw my best chance. Just as false seeming had thought, in everything I would abide by what he thought. The old woman did not linger there, but trotted back to fair welcome, who remained in the tower against his will, for he would gladly have done without his imprisonment. She continued until she came to the entrance to the tower and went quickly in. Gaily, she climbed the stairs. As a swift little as sweetly as she could, trembling in every limb. She went from room over the battlements, pensive, sad, and gloomy, and most unhelped and most unhappy with his captivity. She set herself to comfort him. Fair son, she said, it troubles me greatly to find you in such distress she said it troubles me greatly to find you in such distress tell me about these thoughts for if I can counsel you in any way you will never find me relatant to do so. If a welcome dare not make his complaint, nor tell her all the whys and wherefores. For he did not know whether she spoke the truth or lied. He denied all his thoughts because he did not feel safe and did not trust her in the, in the slightest. Even his fearful, 
trembling heart mistrusted her. But he dare not show it, because he had always been so frightened of the Sinai old whore. He wanted to avoid his conduct because he feared betrayal. And so he did not disclose his unhappiness, but feigned in an inner calm and assumed a cheerful expression. Truly, my lady, he said, in spite of what you say, I am not in the least distressed, except on account of your delay. I am unwilling to remain here without you, for I love you very much. Where have you been for so long? Where? By my head. You will soon know, and the knowledge you, the knowledge. Where, by my head, you will soon know, and the knowledge will bring you great joy. If you have any courage or wisdom, it is no strange messenger, but the most cursed, but the most courteous man in the world, full of every grace, who sends you more than a thousand greetings. I saw him just now in the street as he was passing on his way and he gave me this chapel for you. He says, he says he would like to see you and that to help him, God and Saint Faith, he no longer wants to live nor to enjoy a single day's health unless it is by your wish. He says he would like to be able to speak to you just once a leisure provided you were willing for your sake alone he loves his life he would be glad to be naked in pavia if in this way he could do anything to please you he would not care what became of him provided he could keep you near him. However, before he would accept the present, farewell come asked who it was who sent it for However, before he would accept the present, Farewell come asked 
who it was who sent it to him, for he suspected that it might come from such a source that he would not wish to keep it. And without beating, without, and without beating about the bush, the old woman told him the whole truth. Is the young man whom you know, and of whom you have heard so much, and on, and on whose account the late depart evil tongue once caused you such pain by bringing you blame upon you? May his soul never go to paradise. He has brought down many a worthy man, and now the devils have carried him off for his dead, and we have escaped him. I no longer give a fig for his gossip. We are Queer of him forever, and if he could come back to life, he could not hurt us, however much blame he thought upon you. For I know more than he ever did. Now trust me. And take this chapel and wear it. Give the young man so much comfort at least. For have no doubt, his love for you is true and free for his love for his love for you is true and free from baseness. If he has any other intention, he did not disclose it to me, but we can certainly trust him. For your part will be able to deny his his for your part you will be able to deny his request if he asks for anything he should not have. If he does anything foolish, he must take the consequence. However, he is not foolish, but wise. He has, never done, he has never done anything shocking, and therefore I esteem and love him all the more. He will never be so base as to ask you for something that should not be asked for. He is more loyal than any man alive. Those who bear him company have always testified to this, and so do I. He is very decorous in his habits. And no man born of woman ever heard any ill of him. Except what was said by evil tongue. And that has already been forgotten. I have 
almost forgotten it myself and I do not even remember the words except that they were, fa they were false and foolish and invented by that diff for he never behaved well. I know for certain that the young man would have killed him if he had known anything of it. For he is unfailingly valiant and brave. His heart is so noble that there is no one in the land to equal him. And his largest would exceed that of King Arthur. Or indeed, of Alexander, if he had as much gold and silver to spend as they, however much they gave, he would have given one hundred times as much. His heart is so good that he would have astounded all the world with his gifts if he had such possessions. No one can teach him about largess. Now I recommend that you take this chapel whose flowers are sweeter than balm. By my faith, I would be afraid of incurring blame. Sad fair welcome, shaken and trembling, shuddering and groaning, blushing and turning pale, cried out of countenance. And the old woman thrust it into his hands and wanted to force him to take it, for he dared not stretch out his hand for it, but said, the better to excuse himself, that, that it was more similing for him to refuse it. And yet, he would have liked it. And yet, he would have liked it to keep it, come what might. The chapel is very fair, he said, but I would be better off with my clothes all burnt to ash, then if I dare to accept it from him. But supposing I take it, what then could we say to the quarrelsome creature jealousy? I know very well that she will be wild with anger and tear it from my head.
in pieces and then kill me if she knows it comes from there. Either I will be captured and held in worse conditions than I ever have been in my life or if I escape her and take flight, where will I be able to flee to? You will see me buried alive if, he, if I am captured after my flight. And yet I think that I would be pursued and captured as I fled. For everyone would raise the hue and cry. I will not take it. Oh yes, you will, and without incurring any blame or loss as a result. And if she asks, and if she asks me where it has come from, you will have more than 20 answers. Nevertheless, if she asks me, how can I answer her demand? If I am blamed or rebuked for it, where shall I say I got it? For I shall have to hide it or tell some lie. I assure you, that if she knew, it would, I would be better dead than alive. What can you say? If you do not know and have no better answer, say that I gave it to you. As you know, my reputation is such that you will never be reproached or shamed for taking anything that I may give you. Without another word, Fair welcome took the chapel and placing it on his blonde hair felt more secure. The old woman laughed at him and swore by his soul and body, his skin and bones that no chapel ever suited him so well. Fair welcome, I admired it, it repeatedly, gazing at himself in the mirror to see if it became him well. When the old woman saw that the two of them were alone there, she sat down amicably beside him I began her sermon. Ah, uh, far welcome. I am extremely fond of you, for you are so handsome and worthy. My time for joy has all departed but yours is yet to come. 
I can scarcely stand upright any longer except with a stick or a crutch. You are still a child and do not know what you will do. But I know very well that sooner or later, whenever it may be, you will pass through the flame that burns everything and plunge into the bath thing which Venus makes women bath. I know it well. You will feel the burning brand and I advise you to listen to my instructions and prepare yourself before bathing there. For the young man who has no one to instruct him, bath is there at his peril. But if you follow my advice, you will come safe into port. I tell you if, when I was your age, I had been as white. I tell you if, when I was your age, I had been as wise as I am now concerning the games of love. For I was very beautiful then. But now I must sigh and weep when I gaze at my revenge face with its inevitable wrinkles. I remember how my beauty made the young man skip. I made them thrash about to such an extent that it was nothing less than a marvel. I had a great name in those days, and the fame of my celebrated beauty spread everywhere. My house was so full of people that no one ever saw the like. Many hammered full of people that no one ever saw the like. My heart, retomando, my house was so, my house was so full of people that no one ever saw the like. Many hammered on my door at night for I treated them very harshly and broke my word to them. And this often happened. But I had an other company. Many foolish things were done which angered me. My door was often broken and there were frequent flights that were not settled until lives and lives have been lost in hatred and envy. There were so many quarrels that even if Master August, the great calculator, had taken the trouble to come with his morals, with which he certifies and numbers everything, 
It will not, however, good who was. At some have certified the number of them. In those days, my body was strong and active. But if, as I say, I had been as wise then, I am now, I would now, I would now have a thousand pounds. The fever is telling more than I have. But I behaved very foolishly. I was young and beautiful, silly and irresponsible, and I have never been to the school of love where they teach the theory. But I know it all through practice, experience, which I have pursued throughout my life, has made me wise in love's ways. And since I know now all about it, it is not right that I should fall, that I should fail to teach you what I am. The fruits of my own experience. It is good to advise the young. It is certainly not to be wounded at that you do not know the first thing about it. For you are your own But the fact remains that I observed until in the end I obtained the knowledge. And I could even give a public lecture on it, on it. Not everything that is very old is to be fled from our We have often, we have often encouraged people to hear, people who hear it. I heard. We have often encountered people who were left. In the end, at last, with a fond of sense and experience, however dearly they had bought it. And when not without great pain, I had obtained sense and experience. I deceived many a valiant men who had fallen captive into my toils. But I was deceived by many before I realize it. It was too late. Miserable wretch that I was. I had already left youth behind my door. Which once 
open so often. Night and day, now clung to the lintel. No one is coming today. No one came yesterday. I thought in my grief and misery, I must live in sorrow. My woeful heart almost broke. I wanted to leave the country when I saw my door so quiet and I hid myself, unable to endure the shame of it. How could I have endured it when those young, when those gay young men came who once held me so dear that they could never wear off me. And I saw them pass by and give me a sideways glance. Those who had once been my dear guests they skipped it past and did not two pence for me. They skipped it past and did not give two pence for me. Even those who had loved most in the old days called me a wrinkled, a wrinkled crown, and each of them said much worse things before they had passed me by. Moreover, my sweet child, no one, unless he wore many studios or had experienced great grief, could know or imagine the pain in my heart when I recall to mind the fair speeches, sweet pleasures, sweet delights sweet kisses and most sweet embraces that had flown away so soon. Flown? Certainly. Never to return. It would have been better for me to be imprisoned forever in a tower than to be born so early. My God, how I fretted over the fair gifts that no longer came. What torments I suffered over what remained of them? Alas, why was I born so soon? To whom can I complain? To whom but to you, my son, whom I love so dearly? The only way I can avenge myself is by teaching my doctrine. Therefore, fair son, I will instruct you 
so that when you are instructed, you will avenge me. Upon that way, free for God willing, when the time comes, you will remember my words. I assure you that your age gives you a greater advantage when it comes to retaining and remembering things. For Plato says, It is true that the memory retains best the things that are learned in childhood. Whatever kind of knowledge it may be. Certainly, dear son, tender youth, if my youth were of the of the present as yours is now, I could not adequately convey in writing the visions I would take everywhere I went. I would do such extraordinary things to those scoundrels who esteem me so little, insulting and despising me, and passing me by so basely that you would never have heard the like. Both they and others would pay for their arrogance and scorn. They would get neither pity nor consideration. With the aid of the intelligent God has given me, as I have told you, do you know to what pass I would bring them? I would so pluck them, rob them, right and left, and I would make them die in on swarms and lie stark naked on the hills. First and foremost, those who loved me with most with most loyal hearts and exerted themselves most willingly to serve and honor me. If I could, I would leave them with nothing worth a being. I would have everything in my purse I would reduce them all to poverty and make them all run after me, dancing with rage. But it is pointless to regret it. What, what's done, it's done. I shall never be able to to hold a single one of them. For my face is so wrinkled that they care nothing for my threats. They told me so long ago, those scoundrels who despised me, and it was then that I began to weep. 
and yet by God. The memory of my heyday still gives me pleasure. And when I think back to the gay life that my heart so desires, my thoughts are filled with delight and my limbs with new vigor. The thought and the recollection of it rejuvenates my whole body. It does me all the good in the world to remember everything that happened. For I have at least had my fun. However, I may have been deceived. A young woman leading a life of wantonness is not idle, especially not when she takes care, especially not when she takes care to make enough to cover her. A young woman leading a life of wantonness is not idle, especially not when she takes care to make enough to cover her expenses. Then I came to this country where I met your lady who took me into her service in order to guard you in her enclosure. God, Lord and Guardian of all, grant that I guard you well, and so I shall, certainly, thanks to your good behavior. But the wondrous beauty with which nature has endowed you would have made this a perilous charge had she not taught you such virtue and wisdom, valor and grace. And now, since time and place had fallen so well for us, and there is nothing to prevent our saying that we want to say a little better than usual. I ought to give you some advice, and you must not be surprised if I break off now and then I will tell you in advance that I have no wish to encourage you to love. But if you want to get involved, I will gladly show you the ways and paths I should have trodden before my beauty vanished. Then, the old woman sighed and fell silent in order to hear what he would say. But she did not wait long. For when she saw that she had every intention of listening and keeping quiet. She took up her theme again, 
thinking. Silence certainly indicates consent. If he is willing to listen to everything, I can say everything without fear. Then she resumed her speech, the false and servile crown, imagining that through her teaching she could make me lick honey from thorns. For according to fair welcome, who remembered everything she said and recounted it to me afterwards, she wanted him to call me his lover without loving me. Paramu. If he had been the kind of person to believe her, he would certainly have betrayed me. But he pledged me his word, and this was the only assurance he gave me that nothing she said could have made him commit such treason. Fair, gentle son, with your sweet tender flesh, I would like to teach you the games of love so that when you have learned them, you will not be deceived. Shape yourself according to my art, for no one who, will, for no one who is not well informed will be able to get through without some loss. Now make sure you listen and pay attention and commit everything to memory. For I know all about it. Fair son, if anyone wants to enjoy the British sweet pains of love, he should know love's commandments. But beware, lest love draw him to himself. I would tell you all of these commandments now. If I could not see with certainty that you have by nature more than enough of each. All toads, there are ten commandments that you should know, but it is extremely foolish to burden your oneself with the last two, which are not worth a breath's farthing. I will allow you, I will allow you the first eight. But anyone who observes the other two is wasting his effort and driving himself mad. They are not to be taught in school. To require lovers to have a general's heart and to fix it in one place 
is to impose, to have a burden up upon them. It is a false text, falsely written. Love, the son of Venus, lies, and no one should believe him in it is. Anyone who does believe him will pay dearly for it, as will be apparent in the end. Never be generous, fair son. Bestow your heart in several places, never just in one, and neither give it nor lend it, but sell it very dearly and always to the highest bidder. Make sure that no one who buys it gets a bargain, no matter how much he gives, he must get nothing, for it would be better if he were to burn, or hang, or drown himself. Above all, observe these points. Your hands should be closed to give and open to receive. Indeed, it is folly to give unless the gift is a small one intended to serve as bait and we imagine it to be to our advantage or we expect such a return that we could not have sold it more profitably. I allow you such giving. Giving is good when a giver makes his gifts pay handsomely. If a man is certain of his profit, he cannot repent of the gift. I certainly agree to such a gift. Next, concerning the ball with the five arrows that are so full of good qualities and strike so subtly. And strike so subtly. You know so well how to shoot it that love, that excellent archer, never lost the arrows from that dear bow better than you, fair son, who have so often lost them. But you have not always known where the blows have fallen. For when we shoot at random, the shot may strike someone to whom the archer has given no thought. But to judge by your manner, you draw and shoot with such skill that I can teach you nothing and you will therefore be able to wound someone from whom, God willing, you will derive great 
profit. Nor is it necessary for me to bother teaching you about the fine clothes and trimmings with which you will adorn yourself in order to seem more admirable in men's eyes. It cannot matter to you for you know the song by heart, having heard me sing it so often as we went out to play. The song about Pygmalion's image. Take these as your model for personal adornment. You will then know more about it than an ox does of Plavin. There is no need whatever to teach you these skills. And if this is not sufficient, you will hear me say something presently, if you will listen from which you might be able to learn something. But I can tell you this. If you wish to choose a lover, I advise you to give your love to the handsome young man who values so highly. But let it not be too firmly fixed love others with discretion and I shall find and I shall find you enough of them for you to amass great possessions. It is good to frequent rich men if their hearts are not mean and miserly and if you are skilled at fleecing them. Farewell come may attract as many of them as he likes, provided he gives each to understand that he would not take any other love for a thousand marks in fine powder gold, and provided he swears that, had he been willing to allow his rose, which is most sought after to be taken by another, he would have been loaded with gold and jewels, but that his heart is so true and faithful that no one will stretch out his hand for the rose except him alone, who is extending his hand at that moment. If there are a thousand of them, he must say to each, you alone will have the rose, fair sir, and no one else will ever have a share. May God fail me if I divide it. He must swear it and give them his word. Let him not be concerned about perjuring himself. God laughs at such oaths and will gladly pardon him. Jupiter and the gods used to laugh when loves perjure themselves. And the gods who loved Paramour were often forsworn. Jupiter, when reassuring Juno, his wife, 
Would swear I might oath on the river sticks and was fatally perjured. Those true lovers should be reassured that they too may swear falsely by all the saints, convents, and churches, since the gods give them such examples. But God protect me. Anyone who believes the oaths of lovers is a great fool, for their hearts are too fickle. The young are not reliable, nor very often are they old. Instead, they break their promises and their oaths. It is true, I assure you, that the Lord of the fair must collect his toll from everyone. And if you fail at one meal, pay up to the next as far as you can. The mouse who has only one hole to retreat to has a very poor refuge and he is in great danger when he goes for aging. It is just the same for a woman, for she is mistress of all the bargaining in which men engage in order to have her. She ought to take from everyone since on major reflection she would see that it was a very foolish idea to have only one lover. By Saint Lil Far of Moon, if anyone bestows his love in just one place, then his heart is neither free nor at liberty, but basely enslaved. A woman who concentrates her efforts on loving just one man deserves to have trouble and suffering. If she has no comfort from him, then she has no one to comfort her. And it is those who bestow her heart, and it is those who bestow their hearts in just one place who are worst off. The men will all desert them in the end when they are tired and weary of them. This is no way for a woman to succeed. Little Queen of Karasag could not hold an ass, in spite of all she had done for him, for she had received him, a poor and weary fugitive, a poor and a weary fugitive from the fair country of Troy, his birthplace, and had reclothed and fed him. She showed great honor to his companions because of her great love of him. She showed great honor to his companions because of her great love for him. In order to be of service to him and to please him, she had all his ships refitted, and she gave him her city herself 
on her possessions in exchange for his love. He gave her such strong assurances of it that he promised and swore that he was and always would be hers and would never desert her. But she had little joy of him, for the traitor fled, taking no leave. He sailed away from the sea, which cost the fair Dido her life. For before the day was out, she killed herself by her own hand in her chamber with the sword that he had given her. Remembering her lover and seeing that she had lost his love, she took the naked sword and raised it point upwards, then placing the point beneath her two breasts She fell upon the blade. This must have been most pitiful to see for any who beheld the deed. It would have been a hard man who felt no pity when he saw Ferdiro impaled upon the blade. She drove it through her body. Such was her grief at the way he had deceived her. Phyllis also waited too long for Demophon that she hanged herself when he overstayed his leave and thus broke his promise and his sword. Peleus also waited so long for Demophon that she hanged herself when he overstayed his leave and thus broke his promise and his word. How did Paris behave towards old Noma? How did Paris behave towards old Noma, who had given him her heart and her body, and to whom he in his turn had given his love? He at once took back his gift. And yet he had carved tiny letters with his knife on a tree on the river bank instead of on paper. They were not worth a bottle. These letters were carved in the bark of a poplar tree. And they said that Xanthos would flow backwards if he ever deserted her. Now, let Xanthos return to its source, for he left her afterwards for her long. And what of Jason's conduct towards media? who was so basely deceived in her turn. The traitor broke his word to her, for she had saved him from death when she used her spells to deliver him without burn or injury from the bows that breathed fire from their mouths and that would have burned him or torn him in pieces. She also drugged the dragon for him and sent it into a deep ice lip 
that he could not wake. As for those wild and warlike soldiers born of the earth who would have killed Jason, she made them attack and kill one another when he threw the stone among them. And she gained the fleece for him through her skill and potions. Then, the better to bind Jason to herself, she restored the youth of Jason. She never wanted any more from him than that he should love her as he used to. And recognizing her merits, keep faith with her all the better. Then he abandoned her, the evil traitor, the false, disloyal thief. And when she knew it, in her grief and rage, she strangled her children because they were Jason's. This was not well done, for in forgetting maternal pity, she behaved worse than a cruel stepmother. I could give you a thousand examples, but the tale would be too long. In short, they are all deceitful traitors, ready to indulge their lusts with everyone, and we should deceive them in our turn and not set our hearts upon just one of them. It is a foolish woman who gives her heart in this way. She ought to have several lovers and arrange, if she can, to be so pleasing that she brings great suffering upon all of them. If she has no graces, let her acquire them and always behave more cruelly towards those who will strive all the harder to serve her in order to win her love while exerting herself to welcome those who do not care about it. She should be familiar with games and songs, but avoid quarrels and strife. If she is not beautiful, she should enhance her appearance. The ugliest should be the most elegantly attired. And if she sees that her beautiful blonde hair is falling out, a most mournful sight, or if it has to be cropped as a result of a serious illness, and her beauty does spoil too soon, or if some angry roister should happen to tear it out so that there is no way in which she can regain her thick tresses, she should have the hair of some dead woman brought to her, or pads of light-colored silk, and stud it all into false hair pieces. She should wear such horns above her ears that no stag or goat or unicorn could surpass them. Not though his head were to burst with the effort. And if they need color, they should dye them with many different plant extracts for fruit, wood, leaves, bark and roots have powerful medicinal properties. If her complexion loses its color and her heart is tormented as a result, she should arrange always to have aqueous ointments hidden in boxes in her chamber for the purpose of painting her face. 
but she must take care that none of her guests can smell or see them, otherwise she could be in great trouble. If her neck and throat are fair and white, let her see to it that her dressmaker cuts the neck so low that half a foot of fine white flesh is visible front and back. In this way she will deceive them. In this way she will deceive men more easily. And if her shoulders are too large to be pleasing at dances and balls, she must wear a dress of fine cloth and thus appear less ungainly. If her hands are not fair and unblemished, but married by spots and pimples, she ought not to leave these alone, but use a needle to remove them. Or else she should hide her hands in her gloves so that the spots and scabs are not visible. And if her breasts are too full, let her take a kerchief or scarf and wrap it round her ribs to bind her bosom, and then fasten it with a stick or a knot. She will then be able to disport herself. Next, she must be a good girl and keep her chamber of Venus clean. If she is virtuous and well brought up, she will leave no spider's webs around, but will burn or destroy them. Pull them down, or sweep them away so that no dirt can collect. If her feet are ugly, they should always be covered. Stout legs should wear fine stockings. In short, if she is aware of any fault, she must cover it, unless she is a fool. If she knows her breath is bad, it should not be too much trouble for her to take care never too fast nor ever to speak before she has eaten. And if possible, she should take care not to put her mouth close to people's nose. If she feels like laughing, she should do so with discretion and decorum, so as to reveal two dimples on either side of her lips, and she should neither put off her cheeks, not constrain them in an affected simper. When she laughs, she must never open her mouth, but hide her teeth and conceal them. A woman should laugh with her mouth closed, for a mouth wide open is la for a mouth wide open in laughter is not a pretty sight. It looks like a great gash. And if her teeth are not well spaced but ugly and uneven, she might be less admired if she exposed them when she laughed. There is also a proper way to weep, but every woman has the skill to weep properly wherever she may be. Even when no one has caused them any trouble or shame or annoyance, they still have tears at the ready. They all weep in whatever way they like and make a habit of it. But no man should be moved by it. 
Not if he sees the tears flowing as fast as rain. For a woman only shares such tears and suffers such sorrow and affliction in order to make a fool of him. A woman's tears are nothing but a trap. And her grief is all affectation. But she must take care not to reveal what she thinks by word or by deed. She ought, she ought also to behave properly at table. But before sitting down, she ought to show herself around the house and let everyone know how hard she is working. Let her come and go, back and forth, and be the last to sit down. She should make people wait a little before she is ready to sit down, and once seated at the table, she should, if possible, serve everyone else. She should carve for the others and distribute the bread to those around her. And in order to win favor, she should serve her companion, who will eat from the same bowl before herself. Let her set before him a leg or a wing, or carve the beef or pork for him depending on what food there is, whether fish or flesh. She should never be chary of serving others if they will allow her to do it. She must be very careful not to dip her fingers in the sauce up to the knuckles, not to smear her lips with soup or garlic, of fat meat, nor to take too many pieces or too large a piece and put them into her mouth. She must hold a morsel with the tips of her fingers and dip it into the sauce, whether it be thick thin or clear, then convey the mouthful with care, so that no drop of soup or sauce or pepper falls on to her chest. When drinking, she should exercise such care that not a drop is spilled upon her. For anyone who saw that happen might think her very rude and coarse. And she must be sure never to touch her goblet when there is anything in her mouth. Let her wipe her mouth so clean that no grease is allowed to remain upon it at least not upon her upper lip. For when grease is left on the upper lip, globules appear in the wine, which is neither pretty nor nice. And however great her appetite, she should drink in little sips never draining the full goblet or cup in a single breath, but taking frequent sips. In this way, she will not cause others to accuse her of guzzling it or gulping it down. It should trickle down Delicately, she ought not to stuff the rim of the goblet into her mouth, as many nurses do who are so greedy and stupid 
that they pour the wine straight down their throats, as if into casks, swinging it in such gulps that they become quite fuddled and dazed. She should also take care not to get drunk, for no drunken man or woman can keep anything secret, and when a woman is drunk she has no defenses. But blurts out whatever she thinks. She is at everyone's mercy when she allows such a misfortune to overtake her. Let her avoid let her avoid falling asleep at table, for she would then be far less agreeable. Many unpleasant things happen to those who fall asleep in this way, and it is not sensible to those in places where you are supported to stay awake. Many have been deceived as a result and have often fallen, forwards or backwards, or to one side, fracturing their arm, or their skull, or their rib. She must beware of taking such naps. She should remember Palinurus, who steered Aeneas' ship. While he was awake, he stared her well, but when sleep overcame him, he fell from the helm into the sea and drowned close to his companions, who afterwards mourned him greatly. A woman ought also to make sure that she does not delay too long before taking her pleasure. She could wait so long that no one would be willing to extend a hand to her. She must seek the delights of love while youth still attends her. For once, She is assailed by old age. A woman loses both love's joy and its own sloth. If a woman is wise, she will pluck love's fruit while she is in her prime. For the wretched creature wastes the time and spends without enjoying love. And if she will not accept this advice of mine, which I proffer for the common good, she may be sure that she will repent of it when old age has withered her. But I know very well that they will believe me, at least those who are wise and that they will keep our rules and say many Peter Moster for my soul, when I, who now teach and comfort them and dad. I know that these words will be taught in many schools. Fair and most sweet son, if you live, For I can see that you are happy to write in full all my instructions in the book of your heart, and that when you leave me you will, God willing, continue to teach and be a master like me. I grant you a license to teach, in spite of all the chancellors in chambers and cellars in meadows, gardens, and woods, beneath tents and behind hangings, and to instruct your scholars, and to instruct 
your scholars in wardrobes and attics, pantries and stables if you have no pleasanter place. All this provided that you teach my doctrine when you have learned it truthfully. A woman, a woman must be careful not to let too clustered a life. For the more she stays at home, the less she is seen by everyone, and the less her beauty is known, desired, and sought after. She ought often to go to the principal church and attend weddings, processions, games, festivals and dances. For it is in such places that the guardian goddess of love hold their classes and sing mass to their disciples. But first, she should inspect her reflection carefully to see if she is properly attired. When she feels she is ready and goes out into the streets, she must carry herself well, neither too loosely nor too stiffly, neither too upright nor too bent, but most agreeably in any crown. The motion of her shoulders and sides should be so noble that it would be impossible to find anyone who moved better. And she must walk daintily in her pretty little shoes, which she will have had made to fit her feet so exactly that, will, that they will not wrinkle. If her dress trails or hangs down to the pavement, let her lift the sides or the front of it as if to fill the air a little or because it is her habit. As if she were tucking up her dress in order to walk more freely. Then she must ensure that her foot is exposed so that everyone who passes that way sees her shapely foot. And if she wears a mantle, she must wear it in such a way that it does not hinder people too much from seeing the lovely body it covers. The better to display her body and the fabric that adorns it, neither too loosely woven nor too fine spun and decorated with silver and tiny pearls, the better to display the pearls at any rate, for it is quite right for that to be seen. She must take hold of her coat with both hands and stretch her arms out wide, whether the path is good or moody. She should have in mind the way a peacock makes his tail into a wheel and do the same thing with her mantle, so that the linen whether it be squirrel or a miniver or whatever she has used, is exhibited together with her whole body to those whom she sees hanging around her. If her face is not beautiful, she will, if she is wise, turn towards her rich tresses of fair blonde hair and the nape of her neck, if she knows that her hair is well arranged. A beautiful head of hair is most attractive, 
a woman should always try to be like the wolf who is about to steal a ship. To avoid failure, she will attack a thousand for the sake of one, not knowing which she will take until she has captured it. A woman too should spread her nets everywhere to snare all men. For since she cannot know whose favor she may win, she should sink her hook into all of them in order to attract at least to herself, at least one to herself. If she does this, it will never happen that among so many thousands of fools, She fails to win a single one to rub her flanks. She may perhaps win several, for art is a great aid to nature. If she hooks several who want her on their spit, she must make sure, whatever happens, that she does not sign the same time to two of them for they would consider themselves deceived if several of them came together and might well abandon her. This could bring her very low, for at the very least she would lose whatever each one would have brought her. She should not leave them anything to grow fat on, but plunge them into such poverty that they die wretched and in debt while she is left rich, for the rest is lost to her. She should not trouble herself to love a poor man, For a poor man is good for nothing. Were he Ovid or Homer, he would still be worth less than a couple of drinks. Nor should she take the trouble to a love a visitor. For just as his body is lodged and sheltered in various hostelries, so also is his fickle heart. I do not advise her to love a visitor. Nevertheless, if, while passing through, he happens to offer her money or jewels, she should take them all and stow them in her coffer and allow him to take his pleasure, whether in haste or at le leisure. She must also be very careful not to love or esteem any man who is too elegant or prides himself on his beauty. It is pride that thus tempts him, and you may be sure that any man who thinks well of himself incurs God's wrath. Ptolemy says so. Ptolemy says so. And he held knowledge dear. The heart of a man like that is so evil and rancorous that he is incapable of true love. What he says to one woman he will say to them all, and with many he will use flattery in order to steal and take what they have. I have seen many complaints from young women who have been deceived in this way. If a man, whether a honest man or a scoundrel, pledges his word and wishes to beg for her love and bend her to himself with a promise, she should promise him return, but take care on no account to place herself under his protection unless she has the money first. 
if he sends her a written message, she must see whether he is a hypocrite or whether his attentions are good and his heart true and free from deceit. Then she may write back to him bad times and not without some delay. Waiting makes loves more eager, provided it does not last too long. When she hears her lover's request, she must take care not to give him all her love to Hasley, nor should she altogether refuse it. Instead, she should keep him in suspense between fear and hope. And as he continues to beg and she to refuse her love, which has him so closely bound, the lady must take care to use her wit and her strength in order to reinforce hope. Fear, meanwhile, should gradually fade until it disappears and there is peace and concord between them. Then, when she has made her peace with him, knowing, as she does, all kinds of defeatful tricks, she must swear by God, and he sends that she has never before given herself to any man, however well he may have pleaded. She must say to him, By the faith I owe to the Holy Father in Rome, my Lord, it amounts to this, that I give myself to you out of pure love and not for any gift of yours. I would not have done this for any other man, however great his gift. I have refused many worthy men, for many have courted me. I think you must have bewitched me with the wicked song you sang. Then she must clasp him tightly and kiss him, so as to drive him still further out of his senses. But if she takes my advice, my advice, she will be interested only in what she can get. Any woman who does not fleece her lover of everything he has is mad. The woman who can best fleece him will have the best of him and will be held more dear because she was more dearly, dearly bought. We have nothing but scorn for the things we get for nothing. We care not a jot for them, and if we lose them, we are not worried, at least not so much nor so markedly, as if we had bought them at a high price. But the fleecing must be properly done. The servant and the chambermaid, the sister, the nurse, the mother too, if she is not a simpleton, must all make sure that in return for their help in the affair, the lover gives them coats, jackets, gloves, or mittens, like kites, they should plunder whatever they can lay they, their hands on, 
so that it is impossible for him to escape without giving them gold and jewels. Until, like a gambler, he has stockaged, he has staked his last coin. The pre is finished off far sooner when there are many hands to help. On occasion, they might say to him, Look here, sir, since you ought to be told, my lady needs a dress. How can you let her go without one? By St. Gilles, if she were willing to yield to a certain man in this very town, she could dress like a queen and ride in great state. My lady, why do you wait so long to ask him for it? You are too shy with him. When he leaves you, destitute, destitute, like this. And however pleased she is, she must order them to be quiet, since she has perhaps already taken so much for him as to have done him serious harm. If she sees that he is aware of giving her more than he should, and that he imagines himself to have been straightened by the great gifts which he is in the habit of providing. If she then feels that she no longer dare exhort him to give her things, she should beg him to make her a low one and swear that she is ready to repay it on any day that he will name. But I strictly forbid her ever to repay any of it. If her other friend comes back, she may have many other friends without ever having given her heart to any one of them, but is still calling them all her friends. She will do well to complain that her best dress is one of the securities for a loan on which the interest is mounting up and that as a result she is suffering such distress and heartache that she will do nothing to please him unless he redeems her pledges. If the young man is not very wise, and provided he has a supply of money, he will at once put his hand in his purse or contrive some way of redeeming the pledges, pledges that have no need to be redeemed, since she may have locked them all away on his account in some iron-bound chest. Perhaps so that she need not worry about him searching her coffer and clothes pole, and may better keep his confidence until she gets the money. A third friend should be served a similar trick. I advise her to ask him for a silver girdle, or a dress, or wimple, and also for money to spend. And if he has nothing, and if he has nothing to bring her, but in order to comfort her, swears and promises by hand and foot that he will bring her something next day. Let her turn a deaf ear to his words and believe none of them, for they are false. 
Men are all experts, li expert liars. Letters who have in the past broken more oaths and promises to me than there are saints in paradise. Since he cannot pay, let him at least get credit from the wine merchant for two or three or four pence, or else look elsewhere for his amusement. And so a woman, if she is not a simpleton, should pretend to be alarmed, to tremble with fear, and to be tormented with worry whenever she is about to receive her lover. She should give him to understand that it is truly very dangerous for her to receive him, since for his sake she is deceiving her husband or guardians or parents, and that if the deeds she is willing to do in secret were to come to light, she would be dead, without a doubt. She must swear that he cannot stay, for he would cause her instant death. Then, once she has truthfully bewitched him, he will remain at her pleasure. She ought also to remember when her lover is to come to her to let him in through the window, even if she can see that no one has spied him, and it would be easier through the door. She must swear that she would be dead and done for, and there would be nothing left of him if anyone knew that he was there. Sharp weapons could not save him. No helm or halberd, stake or club, no coffer, recess or chamber could prevent his being torn to pieces, limb from limb. Then the lady should sigh and pretend to be angry. She should attack him and rush at him, saying that he has not delayed so long without good reason, that he has another woman of some kind in his house, whose charms give him greater pleasure, and that she is now utterly betrayed since he has conceived a hatred for her because of someone else. She deserves to be called wretched when he loves without being loved. When he hears these words, the bird-witted fellow will imagine, quite wrongly, that she truly loves him, and she is more jealous of him than ever Vulcan was of his wife Venus when he caught her in the act with Mars. The fool had watched them so closely that he caught them both in nets that he had forged of bronze, held with stout bounds as they were joined and linked in the game of love. As soon as Vulcan knew that he had caught them red-handed in the nets that he had put around the bed, it was very foolish of him to dare to do it, for any man who imagines that he can keep his wife all to himself does not know very much. He hastily summoned the gods who laughed heartily and made merry when they saw them like that. All the gods were moved by the beauty of Venus, 
bemoaning and lamenting her shame and grief at being caught and bound in this way. Never had there been such disgrace. And yet there was nothing very surprising in Venus' attachment to Mars, for Vulcan was so ugly, his hands and face and throat so sooty from his forge that Venus could not possibly have, have loved him, however much she might call him husband. No, by God, not if it had been blonde hair with Absalom or Paris, son of the king of Troy. Would she have pitied him? For she knew very well the charming creature that all women know how to do. More. Moreover, women are born free. The law, the law has bound them by taking away from them the freedoms nature had given them. For nature, if we apply our minds to the question, <laughs> is not so stupid as to create marot simply for Rubicon, nor Rubicon for Mariette, or for Agnes, or for Pirate. On the contrary, my fair son, you may be sure that she has made all women for all men and all men for all women. Every woman common to every man, and every man to every woman. Thus when, in order to prevent dissolute conduct, quarreling and killing, and to facilitate the reading of children. Which is their joint responsibility. These ladies and maidens are affianced, taken and married by law. They still try in every way they can. And whether they be ugly or fair, to regain their freedom. They keep their freedom as best they can. And many evils come and will come of this. And have come so many in the past. I could name you ten. So many indeed. But I will pass over them. that I would be tired out and you would be wary of listening before I had recounted them all. For in the past, when a man saw the woman who pleased him best, he would willingly carry her off at once if someone stronger did not take her from him and leave her. 
if he liked, when he had had his way with her. Those men would kill one another and neglect the bringing up of children until, on the advice of wise men, they began to marry. If you will believe Horace, his words on the subject are sound and true, for he was a very good teacher and writer. I would like to quote him for you now. I would like to quote him for you now. For a wise woman is not ashamed to cite a good authority. In the times before Helen, the lust for women was the cause of battles in which those who fought perished in great suffering. But the names of the dead are not known, since we do not read of them in written accounts. For Helen was not the first, nor will she be the last. For whose sake there were and will be wars between those whose hearts were and will be enamored of women, and as a result of which men have lost and will lose body and soul as long as this world endures. But look closely at nature, for so that you may see more clearly what wonderful power she has. I can give you many examples which are interesting to read about. When a bird from the green woodland is taken and put in a cage where he is most carefully and delicately cared for and sings for the rest of his life with a joyful heart or so you can think he still longs for the leafy wood which it was his nature to love and would like to be in the trees, however well fed he may be. It is his constant thought and endeavor to recover his freedom. He tramples his foot underfoot in the eagerness which fills his heart and goes up and down his cage hunting and searching in great distress for a window or opening through which he might fly away to the woods. In the same way, I assure you, O oh women, whether maidens or ladies and whatever their origin, are naturally disposed to search willingly for ways and paths by which they might achieve freedom, for they would always like to have it. It is the same, I tell you, for the man who enters religion. Later on he repents and almost hangs himself for grief. He complains and laments until he is inwardly full of torment. So great is the desire that wells up in him to do something to recover his lost freedom. For his will does not change. Whatever habit he may assure and wherever he enters the religious life. It is foolish of the fish to go through the mouth of the net. For when he wants to come out again, 
he has to stay a prisoner there forever, in spite of himself, because there is no way to get out. The others who remain outside rush up when they see him, imagining that he is having a good time and enjoying himself delightfully. They see him turning about and apparently having fun. And above all, they see clearly that there is plenty of food there, which is that they all want. And so they want to get in and they swim and turn around and net, bumping and searching until they find a hole through which they dart. But once they have got there and are caught and held forever, they cannot help wanting to get out again, but that is impossible, since they are more securely caught than in a hoop net. They must dwell there in great sorrow until death releases them. This is just the kind of life that a young man is looking for when he enters religion. He will never have large enough shoes, nor learn to make a cowl, or a hat big enough to hide nature in his heart. Having lost his freedom, he is wretched and as good as dead, unless in great humility he makes a virtue of necessity. But nature, who makes him feel his freedom, cannot lie. Even Horus, even Horus, who knows very well how important this is, tells us that if anyone took up a fork to defend himself against nature and cast her out from himself, she would come back. And I know this to be true. Nature will always rush back. Nor will she stay away because of habit. Because of a habit. Why labor the point? Every creature wants to return to its nature and will not fail to do so. However violent the pressure of force or convention, this should excuse Venus for wishing to make use of her freedom. This. This should excuse Venus for wishing to make use of her freedom and all those ladies who take their pleasure although they are bound in marriage, for it is nature, drawing them towards their freedom, who makes them do this. Nature is very strong, stronger even than nurture. Fair son, Take a cat 
which has never seen a male or female rat and is then fed for a long time with attentive care on delicious food without ever seeing a rat or a mouse. If it suddenly saw a mouse coming and it were allowed to escape, Nothing could prevent it from catching it at once. However famished it was, it would leave all its food for it. No effort could succeed in making peace between them. If a colt could be reared without seeing a mare, until he was a great charger, fit to endure the saddle and the stirrup, and then saw a mare coming, you would hear him whinny at once, and he would want to run towards her if there was no one to rescue her. A black horse would not be attracted only to a black mare, but also to a sorrow, but also to a sorrel, or grey, or a depot, if not held back by beet or bridle, for he has looked no further than to see if they are unchithered, or if he can mount them. He would like to attack them, no, he would like to attack them all. And if a black mare were not held back, she would come running to a black horse, or indeed to a sorrel or grey just as her desire prompted her, her. The first one she found would be her husband, for she, in her turn, would have looked no further than to see if she found them unteethered. My remarks about the black mare the sorrel horse and mare, and the grey and black horse are also true of the cow and the bull and the eels and the rams. We have no doubt that every male desires every female. Nor should you doubt, fair son, that in the same way Every female desires every male and receives him gladly. And where natural appetites are concerned, fair son, upon my soul it is just the same for every man and every woman, though law does restrain them a little, a little, too much in my view. For when law has joined a young man and maiden together, it will not allow that the young man to have any other maiden, at least during her lifetime. Nor will it allow the maiden to have any other young man. Nevertheless, they are all tempted to use their free will for I know how important this is. Some are restrained by shame, others by fear of punishment, but nature drives them all, just as she does the beast that we have been talking about. I know thee through my own experience, for I have always 
striving, striving to have all men love me. And but for the fear of shame which we trains and subdues many hearts, I might as I walked along the streets, for I always liked to walk along them covered in jewels. Our doll's costume was nothing in comparison. When the young man whom I found so attractive gave me loving glances, sweet Lord, sweet God, how my heart melted towards them when they gave me the, those looks. I might, as I say, have received all or many of them had then been willing and I able. I would have wanted them all, one after another, if I could have satisfied them all. And it seemed to me that they would all have received me gladly had they been able. I do not accept monk or priest Knight, burger, or canon, clerk or layman, fool or wise man, provided he were in the prime of life. They would have left their orders had they not thought that they might fail when they asked for my love. But if they had really understood my thoughts and the character of women in general, they would not have felt such doubts. I believe that many, had they there, would have broken their marriage for me. None would have remembered to be faithful once he was alone with me. None would have stuck to his condition, his faith, his vows, or his order, unless it were some madman disordered by love who loved his sweetheart loyally. He perhaps might have cried quits and thought of his beloved, whom he would not have given up at any price. But by God and Saint Armand, but by God and Saint Armand, I am quite certain that there are many few such lovers. If a man had spent a long time talking to me, whether he spoke true or falsely, I would have aroused him truly. Whoever he was, secular or religious, girdled with red leather or with cords, and whatever headdress he wore, I believe that he would have taken his pleasure with me had he thought that I desired it, or even simply that I would put up with it. This is nature's way of governing us, by inciting our hearts to pleasure. And therefore, Venus is the last to be blamed for loving Mars. Thus, when Mars and Venus who loved each other, were in this situation, they were many of the gods who would have been glad to be in the same situation and to be left at by the others, just as Maris was. And Lord Vulcan would rather have lost 2,000 marks than have his deed known. For once, the two who suffered such shame saw that everyone knew about it. 
They did openly what they had been doing in secret and were no longer ashamed to be the subject of gossip by the gods. We spread the tale far and wide so that it was famous throughout the heavens. Now Vulcan grew now Vulcan grew even more angry as the situation worsened and he was unable to do anything about it. According to the text, it would have been better for him to endure it than to put the nets around a bed. He ought not to have become agitated, but should have pretended not to know anything about it if he wanted Venus, whom he loved so well, to smile upon him. And so a man should take care if he keeps watch on his wife or sweetheart, and is so stupidly vigilant as to catch her in the act. He should know that she will do even worse once she is caught, and that he who burns with a cruel sickness and has caught her by his skill will never again have possession of her. Nor will she ever look kindly on him or serve him. Jealousy, which burns and torments the one afflicted by it, is a most senseless sickness. But the woman pretends to be jealous and makes a false complaint to befool the fool. The more she deceives him, the more he burns. As if he will not deign to make excuses, but says, in order to provoke her, that he really has another sweetheart. He might find that she is not angry in the least, although she may pretend to be so if he is running after another sweetheart, she should not really care about him, for his philandering. Fool that he is. But she should see to it that he, in his turn, since he has not ceased to love her, should believe that she would like to set her cap at another lover. But simply in order to get rid of him, since she would like to be free of him, and she would be right to separate herself, she would say, you have wronged me too much and I must have my revenge for this injury. <laughs> Since you have deceived me, I will serve you the same dish. And then, if he has any love for her, his situation will be worse than ever and he will have no way out of it, for none can feel the fierce heat of love in his breast unless he is afraid of being cuckolded. 
At this point, the chambermaid in her turn should burst in with a terrified face and say, Alas, we are dead. My lord, or some other man, has entered the courtyard. Then the lady should run and interrupt whatever she's doing. But first, she should hide the young man under the roof or in a stable or a chest until she comes back again to call him out. The young man longs for her return and in his fear and despair would perhaps be glad to be somewhere else. <coughs> now, if it should prove to be another lover with whom the lady has very unwisely made an assassination, so that his time may not be entirely wasted, and although she has not forgotten the first one, she may take the second into one of the rooms. Then he may have his way with her, but he will not be able to stay and will be very unhappy and angry about it. For the lady will be able to save him it is impossible for you to say, it is impossible for you to stay, for my lord is here with four of my cousins. So help me God and Saint German, some other time when you can come I will do whatever you like, but for the moment you must put up with it. Now I must go back, for they are waiting for me. But first she must show him out, so that she may have nothing further to fear from him. Then, the lady should go back and not keep the other one waiting too long in his distress. She ought not to upset him nor he suffered too long. Then the lady should go back and not keep the other one waiting too long in his distress. She ought not to upset him, nor he suffer too much. Then she should make him happy again, and he should leave his prison and lie with her in her arms, in her bed. But let her make sure that he does not lie there without fear. She must give him to understand that she is behaving foolishly and recklessly. And should swear by her father's soul that she pays too dearly for his love when she puts herself at such risk. Although she is safer than those who dance at will through fields and vineyards, the lights enjoyed in security are not so gratifying or so precious. When they are to be together, However permanent their relationship, 
Let her take care that he does not lie with her while she can see daylight. Unless she first half closes the windows. This is to make the place so dark that if she has some mark or blemish on her body, he will never know it. She should beware lest he find anything dirty there, for if he did, he would be on his way at once and take to flight with his tail in the air, which would be shameful and distressing for her. And when they go to work, And when they go to work, they should both exert themselves so consciously and to such good effect that both together experience pleasure before the work is finished. They should wait for each other so that they may come to a climax together. One should not abandon the other, nor should either cease his voyage until they reach port together. Then they will have the light in all its fullness. If she feels no pleasure, she should pretend to enjoy the experience and simulate all the signs that she knows are appropriate to pleasure. In this way, he will imagine that she is glad of it, when in fact she cares not a fig. And if, for safety's sake, he can persuade the lady to come to his house. And if, for safety's sake, he can persuade the lady to come to his home, it should be the lady's intention on the day when she is to undertake the journey to take her time, so that his desire is, great, is greatly aroused before he takes his pleasure with her. The more we delay the game of love, the more agreeable it is. Those who enjoy it at will find it less desirable. When she arrives, when she arrives, at her, when she arrives at the house where she will be so well loved, she must swear to him and assure him that she is trembling with terror because of the jealous husband who is being kept waiting, and that she is very much afraid that he will rail at her or beat her when she goes back home. But however much she may lament, and whether her words be true or false, he must surely be made afraid and fearful for his security. And they must take all their pleasure in private in private. If she is not free to go and speak to him at his home and dare not receive him in hers because her jealous husband keeps her locked up, she should get her husband drunk if she can, 
unless she can think of a better way to be rid of him. And if she cannot get him drunk with wine, she could obtain about a pound of herbs, which she could safely give him to eat or drink. He will then fall into a deep sleep, and as he sleeps, allow her to do whatever she likes, for he will be unable to prevent her. If she has servants, she should send them higher and higher, or else trick them with little gifts into helping her receive her lover. Or she could get them all drunk as well, if she does not want to let them into the secret. She could say to her jealous husband if she likes, My lord, some sickness or fever, gout or abscess is burning and scorching my body, and I must go to the public baths. We have two tubs here, but a bath without steam would be no good. And so I must take a steam bath. When the wretch has thought about it, he will perhaps give his permission, though with a bad grace. But she should, should take her, her chambermaid. But she should take with her her chambermaid or some neighbor who knows all about the situation and who may also have a lover about whom the lady is well informed. Then she will go off to the baths, but she will perhaps not look for a bath or tub, but will lie with her lover unless they think it a good idea to take a bath together for he could wait there for her if he knew she would be coming that way. No man can set a guard over a woman who does not set a guard over herself. Were she to be guarded by Argus, who would spy on her with his hundred eyes, half of which watched, while the other half slept. His vigilance would be useless. Jupiter, Herargus, had cut off to avenge Io, whom he had changed into a heifer and stripped of her human form. It was Mercury who cut it off, and the Zio had her revenge upon Juno. It is foolish to set a guard upon such a creature. But whatever clerks or laymen may tell her, she should be sure not to be so stupid as to believe in anything to do with enchantment or sorcery or witchcraft. Neither Belenus, with all his science, nor any magic arts or necromancy, will enable her so to move a man that he is compelled to love her or to hate another. Medea could not hold Jason for all the spells she cast, nor could all her enchantments help Circe to prevent the flight of Ulysses. 
And so a woman should be careful not to give valuable things. And so a woman should be careful not to give valuable gifts to any lover. However much she may call him her sweetheart. She may certainly give him a pillow, a towel, a kerchief, a purse, provided it is not too costly. Or she might give him a needle case, or some laces, or a belt with a cheap buckle. Or else a pretty little knife or a ball of thread, as nuns often do. But it is silly to consort with nuns. It is better to love women of the world. Less blame will result from it. And such women have more freedom to follow their own inclinations. Being good at foolish husbands and relatives with words. Although both kinds of women will inevitably cost a great deal, still, nuns are much more expensive. A really wise man would be suspicious of any gift that came from a woman. For truth to tell, women's gifts are merely traps designed to deceive. Any trace of generosity is a sin against woman's nature. We should leave generosity to men. For when we, women, are generous, it is a disaster. In a great error, such stupidity is the work of devils. But this does not matter to me, for there are few women who are in the habit of giving. Provided your intention is to deceive fair son, you can make good use of the kinds of gifts I have been talking about. The better to distract simpletons and keep whatever you are given. You should be mindful of that end to which everyone's youth is leading. If he lives long enough, old age, which draws relentlessly nearer to us every day. When you reach that point, do not be thought foolish, but be so well endowed with goods that no one will jeer at you. For acquisitions are not worth a mustard seed. But acquisitions are not worth a mustard seed unless they are kept. Alas, I did not do so. And now I am poor through my own wretched actions. Alas, I did not do so, and now I am poor through my own wretched actions. The great gifts I received from those who abandoned themselves wholly to me, I relinquished to those I loved better. Man gave things to me, and I gave them away. 
And so I have not kept anything. My giving has reduced me to short rations. I never thought of my old age, which, ha which has now cast me into such distress. I did not keep myself from poverty, but allowed the time to slip away as it came. without taking care to control my expenditure. Upon my soul, if I had been wise, I could have been a very rich woman, for great men courted me, for great men courted me when I was pretty and charming and I had some of them firmly in my toils. But by the faith I owe God and Saint Sebald, when I had taken from them, I gave away everything to a scoundrel who put me to great shame, but whom I loved the best. I addressed all the law I addressed all the others as lovers, but he was the only one I loved, although I assure you that he cared not a fig for me and said so. He was a bad man. I never saw a worse one, and he had nothing but contempt for me, calling me a common whore, scoundrel that he was. He never loved me. Women have very poor judgment, and I was a true woman. I never loved a man who loved me. But if this wretch had hurt my shoulder or cracked my skull, I tell you. I would have thanked him for it, however much he beat me. I would still have had him fall upon me, for he was so good at making peace. Whatever hurt he might have done me, however badly, he treated me, beating me, and dragging me about, hurting my face, and brazing it. He would always beg my forgiveness before he left. However humiliating his language to me, he would always show for peace and then take me to bed. And so there was peace and harmony in between us once more. And so he had me on the end of a rope, the false thieving traitor, because he was so good in bed. I could not have lived without him, and I would willingly have followed him everywhere. If he had run away, I would have gone in search of him as far as London in England. Such was my love and affection for him. He put me to shame, and I him, for he used the fine gifts I gave him to lead a riotous life. He never saved anything, but he spent it all dicing in the taverns. He never learned another trade, nor did he need to 
since I gave him so much to spend, and money was mine for the taking. Everyone paid me, and he was happy to spend it. And always on the butcheries, for depraved desires inflamed him. His mouth was so tender that he would not try to do anything worthwhile and had no fondness for any kind of life except one of pleasure and idleness. In the end, as I saw, he got into a very bad way, for he became poor and had to beg for bread, while I had not money enough for two carding combs. Nor had I married a lord, and so I as and so, as I told you, I was reduced to want and came here through these thickets. First son, let my condition be an example to you and remember it. Behave sensibly, so that you will be the better for my so that you will be the better for my knowledge for when your rose is withered and white hairs assay you then you will surely feel the lack of gifts <laughs>